I'm Maureen King, and I graduated in 1964. And I came to the Women's College mainly because I had been intrigued by the stories of a fellow high school student, Mariella Bremner, whose aunt was then the registrar at the Women's College. Had it not been for that, uh, I probably would eventually have learned of the Women's College because I certainly knew and applied to Manhattanville. But um, once I came to this campus and experienced the real warmth and charisma of the Sacred Heart Nuns, I was sold, and I was definitely coming. It was no question after that first, first visit, and certainly my father was not fighting that at all. I will say this, it was the first time I had ever experienced an all-girls environment for school because I, uh, very strangely, in the late 50s, early 60s, went to a co-ed Catholic high school, which was extremely rare in those days. So when I came here, although I loved the school and I loved my teachers, it was unusual not to have a male influence in the class. And there was a certain dynamic that I thought was not there. Um, I think that the male perspective is really, really interesting, and when you've had 13 years of that from kindergarten all through senior in high school, you do miss it. And it was certainly not that we did not have academic competition here because we had some brilliant girls. I mean, we had women who graduated summa cum laude. But that, that took a little bit of getting used to. Oh my goodness, was social life different then than it is today. Um, not in a bad way. The whole the whole time was different. Our dates picked us up on a Friday night, usually wearing a blazer and a tie. And there was a Sacred Heart nun in the women's in the portrait who would call down, call up for us to come down. It was much more, much more formal. Uh, not that we did not have mixers and picnics and things of that sort, but evening dates were different. They were much different than the than the students here at USD experience today. I don't know which way is better or worse, but you know, you flow with the times in which you are. Right. We did have to be in by one o'clock. And I mean, we really had to be in by one o'clock. There were no excuses. If you were in one minute after one o'clock on a Friday night, you were automatically campus the next Friday night. That's just the way it was. There was no discussion whatsoever. So needless to say, we really tried to scoot in as close to one, but before one as we, as we possibly could. We, when we were freshmen, could not go out during the week. And uh, as you became a sophomore and a junior, you were allowed uh, times to go out during the week, but you still had to be in by nine o'clock. It was just a different day of, very honestly, being in at one on the weekend was uh, pretty radical for me. I had to be in at midnight when I was living at home. So it was not, you know, it was not an undue restriction. And we didn't think that much about it because everybody was in the same boat. We signed in and we signed out as resident students. We had our little cards that we put in the card file right outside the president, Mother Danza's office. So it was a far more stratified, stratified society. We were not allowed to leave the campus wearing pants. That included Bermuda shorts. We had to wear a trench coat over pants if we left the campus wearing, wearing pants, which is why you would see young women leaving the women's college in 95 degree heat wearing a trench coat. Uh, we also could not go to dinner in the evening in the same outfit that we'd worn all day. We had to wear either a dress or a matching sweater and skirt or a matching skirt and blouse. And how those nuns remembered what we had on during the day, I will never know. I will never know, but they did. Mother Schaefer and Mother Lawrence 
would nail you every time if you tried to get by with what you had worn in English class sometime during the day. I was an English major, and of course, the size, the class size depended on, on really where you were in that process. We had more students in the classes during our freshman and sophomore years because the classes were, were much more, much more basic. So you might have 30 women in a class, in honor, you might have 30 women in a, in a theology class, for example. Um, honors English, probably 20 people freshman year. And by the time we got into our majors in junior, in our junior and senior years, the classes were smaller yet. You did not come to class unprepared because there was nowhere to run and nowhere to hide. It was a very one-on-one -on -one professor-student relationship. And we did learn a lot. We, whether we wanted to or not, we learned a lot. So it was, I don't know how big the class sizes are today. I still hear from students that, that they have close relationships with their professors, which is nice to see that that tradition has gone on. Uh, Sally Fury was probably the professor um, who taught me more than any other, uh, not just because she's Sally Fury and she tends to do that, but because I had her for so many classes. I had her in my freshman year for theology and for honors English. I had her again for theology in my sophomore year and again for English. And I think I took every upper division English class and a couple of drama classes uh, that she taught. So she had a profound influence on me. And her, her teaching style worked with my learning style, so it was a very symbiotic, wonderful relationship. The, the tradition that, that really kicked us off as freshmen was that we had very many solemn First Friday Masses and required solemn assemblies. And on those occasions, we wore caps and gowns and white gloves and, and heels. So when we were freshmen, we had to buy a cap and gown. That doesn't that didn't happen often in that era. I'm quite sure it never <laughs> happens today. But that was a tradition here. We had the tradition of the lily procession in February on the Feast of the Purification. And there were also other little things that happened every day. If you were a resident student, you were literally tucked in at night by one of the nuns. There was a knock on the door and you were supposed to be in bed at 10 o'clock, and one of the nuns came around with holy water every single night, ostensibly to give us holy water, really to make sure that the lights were out and that we were in bed. We could get late lights if we applied for it. In my case, it never mattered. No one ever hesitated to give me late lights. They knew I would be sound asleep by 10, 15, anyway. But other traditions, First Friday Mass, was, was something that we celebrated every single month. We would have a president's, a president's assembly at least once a month. And those were re things that we were required to attend. And of course, we attended student body meetings again uh, every, every, every other week, as, as I recall. Yeah. We met young men, our dates, the people with, with whom we went out in a lot of different ways. Uh, we had mixers at the Women's College, which were infamous. Uh, on Friday night, the fellows on the other side of the street would refer to the Women's College as the foods because there was always food, much better food than what we had during the week, I might add. So that was one avenue. And of course, we had the Navy in town in, in those days, and this was pre-Vietnam, so the chaplains, the Navy chaplains, would, would confer with Mother McShane, and uh, we would always have uh, a cadre of young naval officers on the campus. So there were lots of ways. And of course, your friends introduced you that none of that has changed at all. But meeting people did not seem to be a problem. And after all, there was only a 
only Miriam Way between the men's and the women's college. It wasn't, it wasn't a vast chasm in, in any respect. Favorite place on campus? It would be a toss-up for me between Founders Chapel, where so many events took place. Uh, our graduation mass was there. I mean, all sorts of wonderful events took place in Founders Chapel. And the other spot would have been the Camino Theater, now known as the Shiley Theater. Both venues are beautiful. They're just beautiful. I loved the Camino Theater because um, I was a drama minor. And I mean, I even loved the hard seats that we used to have. It was just a beautiful, beautiful place to be. Uh, so many wonderful things happened in the chapel and so, so many not so wonderful things. It was in Founders Chapel that the entire student body learned that President Kennedy had died. Uh, we were told that he was shot probably at about 11.15 in the morning and the, the whole student body without really being told gravitated to the chapel and we said the rosary, and at about noon, I was passed a little note saying that the president had died. I was student body president at the time, so I was the one to have to tell that congregation of young women gathered in the chapel that the president was dead. It was a moment I will never forget. I mean, we all know where we were when, when Kennedy was shot. But that was one of the not so wonderful memories of Founders Chapel. So I couldn't really pick whether it would be Founders or, or the Camino Theater, but they were both wonderful spots. Mm -hmm. You want to accomplish something that you perceive to be a good, and the way to do it generally is to take the lead. Somebody has to do that. Leadership in the nonprofit world. Uh, actually, I did begin on the board of the Alumni of the Sacred Heart. I was on that board before I graduated, just because I, I was a student representative as, as student body president. Uh, and from there, from there, I became active in my children's school and was president of the school board in the parish. I was very fortunate to be involved in a couple of work organizations in town. One, um, the Juniors of Social Service Auxiliary, which uh, supported Bayside and Camp Oliver. So it was easy to, to exercise leadership skills there. I also was uh, a member of the Junior League and on that board for many years. So I had a lot of really, really good, good training as a volunteer in leadership roles. And then when my children were in grammar school, um, some of them almost ready to leave grammar school and go on to high school, it was ready to, I was ready to go back into the world of the gainfully employed. And I had a call one day from, from uh, an individual who I did not know who said, I've just seen your resume and I think you would make a great development director for Menge International Museum. Please call Martha Longenecker at 453-5300. And that was the beginning of the second part of, of my, my leadership life, but still always in the, the world of the nonprofit. And that led to eventually moving to Mothers Embracing Nuclear Disarmament, which was a very, very conservative peace organization. Um, and I was the executive director of that. It was the, at a time when the Soviet Union was about to fall and what we were doing were educational exchanges of mothers and children uh, between the United States and what was then the Soviet Union. So it, that role just evolved and grew and it never seemed difficult. I certainly didn't have a, a plan in front of me, as they say you really should. I was very lucky, very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time for many of these changes in my life. 
and um, was fortunate enough to be able to seize the moment, which is uh, involves opportunities that aren't always available to people. So it wasn't just having some skills that I had acquired. It was definitely a, a great deal of good fortune along the way as well. And we would take American mothers and their children and put them with Soviet mothers and children. S when we first began doing this, it was still illegal to live in a Soviet home. It was against the, against the law in that country. So what we would do then is put all the mothers and kids on a riverboat along the Volga River, along the Moscow River and Canal, and bring them together for conversation. Most of them spoke English, uh, although not always, so we did travel with, with translators. But then ultimately, the Americans could live in the Soviet homes. And then we'd bring the Soviets over here and do the same, for, uh, put the Soviet mothers and, and children in American homes, in Washington, D.C., and in New York, and in L.A., and in San Diego. Menge International Museum has really a unique position almost anywhere because Menge simply means the art of the people. It is something that is made by hand, that is beautiful, and it's made for use. It's not made to hang on a wall necessarily. It can be used in the home, it can be used in business, it can be used for ceremonial purposes. So it encompasses not just folk art, but also craft and design. For example, the museum is doing an exhibition this summer that's called Surf Craft, and uh, the subject is surfing and surfboards, which are beautiful, some of them, and, and used, and of course there's a great tradition and history of, of surfing here in San Diego. So you might have a contemporary exhibition of, of Dale Chihuly's glass, or you might have um, a very, very historic show of pre-Columbian art, most of which was used for ceremonial purposes. So it, it encompasses, encompasses a really, really broad area. But the mission of Minge is to bring the art of the people to the people. It's as, it's as simple as that. Right. I was chairman of the Scripps Mercy Foundation Board. Uh, as a matter of fact, I just stepped down at Christmas time. And of course, that was so different than anything that I had ever done because I'd never worked with any nonprofit in the medical or health area before. So the learning curve was so much fun. It was so much fun. And of course, given healthcare today and given the advancements in, med in medicine, that learning curve is constant. It's constant and it's very, very energizing. And raising money for healthcare is uh, a very, very gratifying thing to do. Uh, raising money is a, a wonderful thing to be able to do. I mean, there are people who love to do it and people who don't don't like to do it. I have that. I'm one of the ones who has that strange gene that thinks raising money is is fun, and that's basically what the Scripps Mercy Hospital Foundation does. We preserve the mission that was started by the Mercy Sisters, and we raise money. So it, it was a, a unique treat and a real privilege to serve, on, to serve as chairman of that board. In terms of skill sets, one of the things that, at least in my era, a women's college provided was the opportunity to exercise leadership skills on campus. When I was in high school, in, the, in a co-educational high school, I was the vice president of everything. It was a time when women were not, were not really even considered, and it, no, one, no one questioned this. Um, no one questioned this at all. Women weren't student body presidents at that time. That's all changed today. But for me, being here at a time when this was the Women's College gave me tremendous opportunities. And I think in, in terms of values necessary for leadership, 
you learn transparency, and I learned that here. I learned to certainly speak up for what those things in which I believed, and not to shy away from from actually presenting a full and truthful picture of, of what's going on. Those are all things that I learned at, at USD. I also learned the value of, of the individual and the fact that individuals offer us different things at different times in our lives and that everyone needs to be treated with respect for those skills, those talents, those wonderful characteristics that help shape all of the projects on, on, on which we, we work. USD is a very different place than it was in the early 60s. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's not a bad thing at all. Um, although at the time of the merger, when the men's and the women's college came together, I had extremely ambivalent feelings. Quite honestly, I felt the quality of my diploma was being compromised because, rightly or wrongly, I felt we had a much stronger educational system at the women's college than, than was had at the men's college. I certainly don't feel that anymore. I think Art Hughes, in his wisdom and brilliance, merged the, the two colleges and led it forward. And it's been upward and onward ever since. The, the university has been very fortunate in having uh, presidents who had the skills that the university needed at the time. Art had that wonderful ability to work with people and to seamlessly, seamlessly bring this wonderful campus together. Alice Hayes, took us into the technological age uh, with her own sense of charm and her incredible fundraising ability. And now Mary Lyons has really given the university a much more universal uh, perspective. So we've had wonderful, wonderful presidents over the course of the years. But certainly the, the students today have a lot more freedom than, than we did. Uh, we didn't necessarily rankle against all of those early restrictions. Um, they don't have the fun of the challenge that, that we did in, in many ways. But um, some people say that the, that the students are so much smarter than they were. That may be true. It may not be true. I don't know. Certainly, the food is so much better <laughs> than it was when we were here. If you walk into that student center, it is, it's absolutely phenomenal. Good, healthy food, and you don't see paper and plastic. You see things that are, that are washed and recycled. It's just, it's a, that is hugely different. But the values are still the same. The, the, the core of the university is, does not appear to be that different to me. And I certainly hope it's not because Charlie and I have a granddaughter coming here in the fall, which will be the fourth generation of our family to, to attend USD. So I am hopeful that those core values are as unique and as, as centered and grounded as they always have been. Sally. Well, certainly Sally Fury had a profound effect on my life um, because I, I was with Sally not only as a teacher, but um, as, as a student leader, and she as a counselor and an advisor, uh, worked with me on many, many, many issues. And we have remained friends over, over the course of the years. I've also had the, the wonderful opportunity to work with Art Hughes in his retirement on uh, a couple of boards, on the Menge board and on the, on the Mercy Foundation board. And Art, you cannot work with Art Hughes without being influenced by him. Uh, he is so present to you. And I think Art Hughes uh, answers questions better than almost anyone I have, I've ever worked with in my life. 
Martha Longenecker, who was the founder of Menge International, influenced me greatly, greatly. Um, a very strong woman, as is Sally Fury. Martha passed away uh, last fall, but she had a profound effect on me. I also had a wonderful friend and mentor in Jim Mulvaney, who uh, nipped at my heels and always encouraged me to, to take that next step and to, to try, to, not to be afraid to try almost anything. He was very, a very positive reinforcement in my life. And those are really the essential people who have, have shaped me over the course of the years. Um, Charlie and I are, are both cradle Catholics, so it's part of who we are. I mean, it's, it's just part of the, the tradition and the tradition that we pass on to our children. And our parish is very, very central to us. I mean, our, many of our friends are, are friends from our parish. So it's that unique sh uh, ability to be with individuals with whom you share values that is central to, to our lives. I can remember at one point in time, um, we were, we were outgrowing our house. I mean, we've always been outgrowing our house. And we've been in the same house for almost 49 years. And I would look around town, and it would all, always come back to, you know, we really don't want to leave All Hallows. And of course, by that time, our, our children were in All Hallows, but eventually they were out of All Hallows and were at uni high. But there was definitely a pull to, to the parish. Your Catholic values are with you forever, forever and ever.